Amongst the huge collection of antique clocks, watches and timepieces held at the Museum of Timekeeping, there's another entirely separate but just as important collection, and that is the museum's collection of speaking clocks. What is the speaking clock? I hear you all ask. Well, the speaking clock was designed in 1936 and it was set up as a way of passing the time across to everybody in the United Kingdom that had access to a telephone. It was a direct response to the Parisian speaking clock, which was made in the 1920s. When the GPO engineers went across the channel to see their speaking clock in Paris, they were incredibly impressed. They thought this is an amazing piece of kit, a really impressive leap in technology. However, there was a major problem with it, and that was that it only serviced central Paris. The GPO engineers went away and had a think and decided that they could come back to London and make an even better speaking clock service. They wanted to make a speaking clock service for the whole country, something that had never been done before. This is speaking clock number one. As I mentioned, it was set up in 1936, and what we see here represents half of one suite. So there would have been an identical piece of machinery like this alongside it, one being the primary clock and the other being the secondary. The idea behind that being that if maintenance work had to be carried out on one, or if one should fail, the other could pick up the job of the first, or vice versa. In 1936, the technology to create a clock like this didn't exist. So what we see is one of the most innovative clocks of its kind. I'm going to turn the light on now so that we can see inside a little better. So what we can see here look like four vinyl discs set up in the machine. Well, they're not vinyl, they're actually pressed glass. So each of these discs has the audio pressed onto it, which is in turn read by a series of lamps called exciter lamps, which you can see here. There are eight of these, two for each disc. Along the front of the machine here, there's a large crank, which turns a series of gears, moving those discs and the lamps into place to read the correct seconds, minutes, hours, and phrases. Now we're really fortunate at this museum to have an incredible team of conservation and maintenance experts. The electrical horologists um, who are involved with this machine took it from being completely condemned to being in working condition. And in a minute, I will play the voice of the speaking clock for you so that you can hear that for yourself. What everyone remembers about the speaking clocks, rather than the machinery that produces the sound, are the women and the men who voiced them over the years. I'm going to talk to you now about the very first person to voice the speaking clock, Ethel Kane. Ethel was chosen from a panel of over 12,000 hopeful telephonists working with the General Post Office in the 1930s. The GPO took it upon themselves to offer auditions to all women who wanted to take part. If we think about the societal context of the 1930s, we were in that post-war period. However, we knew by then that the Second World War was just around the corner. There was a lot of negativity in the press. There was a lot of fear and bad feeling around in general. And what the competition to find the person to voice the speaking clock did was offer a light-hearted, fun thing for the media to grab hold of and run with, to distract from the doom and gloom that was in the everyday press. This meant that rather than just being a quick in-house competition between other telephonists, the search for the girl with the golden voice became a huge event. It was on billboards, it was in the newspaper, it was talked of on the radio, and it was really exciting to the general public. It was, in many ways, the first X Factor. Um, and so, as a result, the girl with the golden voice was going to become rather famous. After whittling down the 12,000 telephonists to the final nine, 
They were asked to read from a selection of poetry, um, Charles Dickens' novel, A.A. A. Milne, and also, of course, read all of the numbers, 1 to 12, several times over, whilst the judges in the other room listened on gold plated headsets. I mean, this really was a high profile competition. Eventually, it was Ethel Kane who was chosen to be the girl with the golden voice, which is the name that the media gave the winner. She was ecstatic. She won a prize of £500, which in 1936 was a sizable amount of money. She won a number of contracts um, using her image in, in all kinds of advertising for the speaking clock, and she rapidly became a household name. There was, however, a problem, which hadn't been foreseen, because one person who really should have been on that board of judges, but wasn't, was the sound engineer Eugene Wender. Eugene Wender was the head of sound for the British Film Institute in the 1930s, so an incredibly skilled sound, uh, sound engineer. And he met her in person after she had received her prizes, listened to her talking for a matter of seconds, and halted proceedings saying, she's no good, you need to find me a new girl. The GPO were flabbergasted. Well, they couldn't find a new girl at this point because they'd already paid her £500. She was already a household name and they'd already given her all of these modelling contracts for their advertising. It just wasn't possible. What on earth is wrong with her? It turned out that she had a slight misalignment of her front teeth, meaning that her S's whistled. Not a problem during speech and in fact barely noticeable, but given the audio recording apparatus available in the 1930s, Mr. Wendon knew that all you would hear was the high frequency whistle of the S's as she said, it is 6.06 precisely. As you can imagine, if there was a lisp there, that wouldn't be clear at all. In today's modern technology scape, it would be incredibly easy to knock those high frequencies out. It would just be a couple of clicks of a button on a computer program and she would have a crystal clear enunciation of her S's. However, those technologies were not available in the 1930s. And as a result, Mr. Wender said, really the only thing that we can do is to cap her teeth. Well, Ethel Kane was quite a forthright young woman and she was quite fond of her teeth, just as they were, so she refused and said, no, you have taken me on for this role as I am. You should have realised that there was an issue before. I'm not having my teeth capped. What are you going to do about it? The GPO, as such companies are wont to do, went back to Mr Wender and somehow made it all out to be his fault that the girl wasn't right for the job. And he spent the next 12 months after recording painting by hand every high frequency whistle off the four glass discs. It was the first time that this kind of audio editing had ever been done and paved the way for audio editing suites of the future. Now, when Jane Kane, as she was later known, finished her contract with, uh, with the GPO, she moved to Hollywood, where she enjoyed quite a successful career as bit part English woman in a number of American films. And this machine ran from 1936 all the way through to 1963. As I said earlier, this is one half of a twin suite. In mid 1940s, there was a second double suite commissioned and that was because during the Second World War, it was thought that if London, where these were housed, was bombed, it was imperative that this service kept running. So to protect it from bombing, they placed the second double suite at Liverpool docks. Now, for anyone who knows their history, Liverpool Docks was probably the second most bombed place in the country, but I'm pleased to report that both double suites survived the Second World War. The twin of this suite is now housed in Edinburgh Museum, but is not operational. And sadly, we don't know what happened to the two Liverpool suites at all. They are probably decommissioned and have been turned over to, to dereliction at some point. I'm going to put on speaking clock number one now so that we can hear it for ourselves. And you will note that it's not ever so clear and I'll explain why that isn't clear once I've turned it on.
Now what we can hear there is Ethel Kane's voice, but you'll note that there's an awful lot of crackle and hiss around that as well. This is because in the 1930s, when this machine was commissioned, the light bulbs which read the glass discs were especially calibrated for the job. They have to be exactly the right strength, the right luminosity, even the right colour of light. And unfortunately, the calibrated bulbs for this machine are no longer available. Several years ago, the museum did find a supplier in China who were willing to set up a production line for these, but only if we bought a box of 20,000. Given that in the last 81 years, we've used 16, it didn't really seem very cost effective. So although the voice is quite unclear, at least we can hear her and, uh, and proudly say that this machine is running as it should be. Speaking clock number one ran for an impressive 27 years. But come 1963, it was decided that things had moved on in terms of technology and it was time to update the system. This machine is speaking clock number two. Well, I say it's speaking clock number two, technically it's speaking clock number three. Between speaking clock number one and this clock, Australia came across our speaking clock and decided, you know what, that sounds like a great idea. So they asked the GPO to create a speaking clock for use in Sydney. So speaking clock number two went across to Sydney, which is actually where it is still housed at Sydney Museum. And this is speaking clock number three. Now for the sake of argument, I'm just thinking of British speaking clocks. So we're gonna call this one number two. Confused yet? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking clock number two was commissioned in 1963 and ran all the way through to 1985. Whereas speaking clock number one had two huge individual clocks pressed together, this suite here is those two clocks. So we have the primary and the secondary right next to each other here. So we can see that already technology has allowed this clock to halve in size. Just like before, there was one clock situated in London and another situated in Liverpool. But rather than the four glass discs for the audio recording, we now have an electric, an, an electromagnetic drum here. And here we can see the minutes, the hours. So they're all on little arms down here, which just hover above that electromagnetic drum in order of sequence to read the time out to people. Now, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this clock at the moment. It failed its pat test last week. So what I'm going to do is move on quite swiftly from this one to speaking clock number three. And once this one is back up and running, I'll make a separate video so that you can hear the voice of Pat Simmons. Now, Pat Simmons, again, was a telephonist. She worked as a supervisor for Brighton and Hove Exchange. And somewhat differently to Ethel Kane, rather than going on to being a fairly successful movie actress in Hollywood afterwards, after getting fame and fortune through the speaking clock endeavor, Pat Simmons won 250 pounds cash, still a very large sum of money in the 1960s, but nowhere near the amount, relatively speaking, that Ethel Kane was awarded. And rather than going on to be a famous actress, she went back to her job as a supervisor at Brighton and Hove Exchange, where she remained until she retired. In 2017, the GPO, who are now known as BT, got in touch via the BT archives to ask the museum if they would like to take on speaking clock number three. We jumped at the chance, having already got speaking clocks number one and two in our possession. Speaking clock number three arrived in October 2017 and, I must admit, came as something of a surprise. When we were discussing taking the clock into the collection, it was described to, to me as being roughly the size of a filing cabinet, 
and that it would be no problem at all for someone of my height and stature to be able to move it into the museum unaided. There are five quite large stone steps to get up. This machine weighs around half a tonne. And then, to add to the surprise, not only did this machine arrive, but this piece of kit came with it. When they were unloaded from the van by the single driver who came to drop them off for us, my first thought was, my goodness, these are going to have to stay in the car park as a permanent art installation out there. Now, fortunately, the British Horological Institute had one of their clock making workshops on that week, and I was able to commandeer the help of nine men from the clock workshop to come and help carry this in by hand and put it in place in the speaking clock exhibition room. Speaking clock number three ran from 1985 through to 2008, and this housed the first male voice. The reason that women's voices had historically been chosen for the speaking clocks was one of practicality. If you remember from hearing speaking clock number one working, there was a lot of background mechanical noise. And also the telephone lines of the 1930s through to the 1960s were not that clear, they weren't that loud and they weren't necessarily very reliable. So it was thought that the, uh, the bassier tones of a male voice would simply be lost in amongst all of that other background sound. However, we are now into the digital era. So these were digitally recorded onto sound cards, which would have sat in these slots here. We can see this is clock A and this is clock B. So whereas with the other clocks, we had these dual suites side by side, in this clock, the two separate clocks are here just above each other. And we can see that they're much, much smaller again than the 1963 model. And as I've said, these had a male voice. This featured the voice of Brian Cobby, again, um, an, another employee of, of the GPO, um, or BT as it was by then. And he recorded the time in the early 1980s. Now the sound cards themselves, which should slot in here and here, are actually missing. I'm hoping against hope that one day they turn up at the BT archives and they are sent to us. But for now, we do have a recording of Brian Cobby that I can play for you when we have a look at speaking clock number four in a few minutes. When this switchboard arrived, I wasn't too sure what it had belonged to. It's the same colour and looks the same age as speaking clock number two, but it arrived as part and parcel of speaking clock number three. When I investigated a bit further, it came to light that this switchboard was actually the main switchboard for speaking clock two and began its life in 1963 before finally being decommissioned in 2008. It's quite astonishing that a piece of kit would be used for so many years continually. Last in the story is speaking clock number four. This machine took over from speaking clock number three in 2008 and then ran until 2019. So we're talking pretty contemporary. This clock, well, I was going to say it came to us earlier this year which is true, but it was supposed to arrive with us immediately after it was decommissioned in 2019. That didn't happen, however, because of the pandemic, uh, it just became impossible to get a date in the diary for Mr. Julian Day of Telligent to come and fit the machine. Telligent are the company who not only created this clock, they also run the current speaking clock as well, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. When this clock arrived, one of the most exciting things about it is that unlike the other three clocks in the collection, this one is actively connected to the time signal from Greenwich. That's done by this satellite receiver here. And when it was set up, my goodness, we tried every possible position for this in the room. We put it up high, we put it to the side, tried everywhere, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't pick up the signal. And eventually Julian almost gave up and said, okay, it will just have to play the voices without being registering the correct time. He popped the receiver on top of the machine and lo and behold, it picked up the signal within a matter of seconds. So this clock is accurate, well, as accurate as the speaking clock, as it is still acting as the speaking clock, you just can't call it.
One of the beautiful things about this clock is it allows you to have a range of voices and there were a huge number of voices that we could have chosen from. The first one that we chose to have added is Brian Cobbies, who, if you'll remember, was the first male voice of the speaking clock and was the gentleman who voiced speaking clock number three. And this is his voice now. Two and ten seconds. At the third stroke, the time sponsored by Accurist will be two, thirty-two and twenty seconds. Now, after Brian Cobby, the next voice was that of Sarah Mendez de Costa. Sarah was the voice of the speaking clock through a competition, and this is her recording now. It will be 2, 32 and 40 seconds. At the third stroke, the time sponsored by Accurist will be 2, 32 and 50 seconds. Now, after the time sponsored by Accurist became inaccurate as that contract came to an end, the speaking clock was taken up as a charitable fundraiser. It's still going today and you can ring 123, I do warn you, it's 50 pence per minute so don't make a habit of it, but you can ring the speaking clock and ordinarily the speaking clock is now celebrating one charity or another, most commonly sport relief, comic relief and children in need. And they have a variety of television personalities, characters and celebrities to do the voice of the speaking clock. Amongst them are Lenny Henry, We also have stars like David Walliams, the actor and children's author. B234, precisely. Splish, splash, splosh. At the splosh, the time for sport relief will be 2.34 and 10 seconds. Splish, splash, splosh. Now, in amongst all of these celebrities, we also have the standard voice of the speaking clock as well. And after Sarah Mendes de Costa um, came to the end of her contract, it was the voice of Alan Steadman who became the regular voice of the speaking clock. Not only is Alan another man and the only second man to ever fulfil this role, he is also a Scotsman and it is the first voice with a regional accent to be featured on the speaking clock as a permanent voice. And this is Alan Steadman. It will be two, 34 and 50 seconds. At the third stroke, the time from BT will be two, 35 precisely. Now we also have some fun characters as well. So any of you that have small children that like Disney's Tinkerbell, I know I certainly have a couple that did, will be familiar with this voice. Hi, it's Tinkerbell. At the third bell, the time will be 2, 35 and 20 seconds. Hi, it's Tinkerbell. She's very peppy. But finally, my favourite I think, is the voice of the Daleks from Doctor Who. Now, the voice of the Daleks from Doctor Who were recorded for the speaking clock, but it was deemed that it was too frightening for small children for comic relief or for children in need to have these, uh, the, you know, these um, imaginary monsters telling you the time. So they tried to make it sound a little bit more accessible, a bit more fun by getting them to say the Daleks sponsor children in need. However, it was still deemed to be too frightening for, uh, for the general public. So I suppose in a really strange way, we can claim to be the only place in the world that the Daleks from Doctor Who can tell you the accurate time. And, uh, and here that is now. Now, there is still a speaking clock being used now, 
And interestingly, the speaking clocks still receive around 150,000 calls every year, which is roughly the same number of calls as back in 1936 when they first started the service. Of course, during that time, there's been a huge peak and it's now levelled off as people now carry the phones around with them with the time on or laptops or screens of some kind or another. However, I did ask a group of physicists who visited the museum, you know, I sort of said, I can't imagine who on earth would still ring the speaking clock. And they looked at each other a little bit uncomfortably and said, well, actually, we all do. And if you think about it, if you have in your home a laptop and perhaps a digital radio in one room and an analog radio in the other, the time on all three of those devices will be slightly different. Even if you have two smart speakers on in different rooms, there will always be a lag between the two. So you're not actually getting the true time, even if you're setting a timer with them. So what they use is the speaking clock. So it's good to know that it's still used. Of course, its most popular times are New Year's Eve and when the clocks go forward and when the clocks go back. You know that awkward few minutes after waking up where everyone stares at their phones thinking, oh my goodness, has it changed or am I actually an hour late for work? Um, and, uh, and yeah, still a very, very popular service. The device that has taken over from this one is not a device like this. It is now a computer program running constantly to deliver the time via telephone. That means that when the next speaking clock, the current speaking clock five is decommissioned, there will be nothing to come to our museum. It will simply be switched off and the service will disappear into the ether.